Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Holly, and I'm an alcoholic. First, I want to thank you for inviting me out here to what I call one of the most interesting, beautiful pieces of God's carpet. This is a lovely, lovely state. It's beautiful. And anybody that doesn't appreciate living out here, they should take you out there and hang you on one of them cactuses on the mountain <laughs> because it is very beautiful. Belle gave me a tour yesterday, which was lovely. Now, I'm not going to spend this whole morning standing here telling you how drunk I got. I'm not going to do that. It goes back to what Shakespeare said. When I stand on a beautiful Sunday morning like this and tell you, give you a blow-by-blow description of my drinking, it would be as a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Through the grace of God and this fellowship, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink for the past 30 years. And, uh... <laughs> but now, I didn't do this by myself. You better believe it. I did not. People, God first, and people. That's why I'm here. Yeah. I told my girls at home, or they told me, now, Holly, you're going to speak on Sunday morning, so don't use any bad language. I said, I don't use bad language. And don't tell me what to say. Well, they're going to tell you what to say when you get there. I said, no, no, I don't believe that. They're much nicer people than you are, and I don't believe they're going to say that. And that's the way I look at it. I like to start out by telling you about a parable that I read and have heard many years from the Book of Books, which certainly typifies most of us, I believe. The Book of Books, which is the Bible, of course. I'm sure you know that. Someone says, Oh, now don't start quoting that out of the Bible. That is not, shall we say, um, literature that we are supposed to hold it. Don't tell me no more about it. I'll do it alike. After all, I always tell everybody, I didn't ask to come out here. You invited me, so I'll say what I want to. (laughs) But this parable tells me something about me. A sower went out to sow seed. Some of the seed fell by the... Some of the seed fell by the wayside and the birds devour them. That is the person to me that comes into our fellowship. And he don't like what the big book says, so he's going to rewrite it, you know? And he's going to fall right by the wayside, and the birds are sure going to get him. Then again, the sower goes out to sow seed, and this time, the seed falls among thorns and thistles. And the roots of the thorns and the thistles are so strong that they soon, very soon, shall we say, cause the little seedling to die. That is the person that comes into the fellowship. Boy, am I inventory taken this morning. (laughs) Comes into the fellowship and says, well, you know, I I think I can do the things that I used to do. As the big book says, we thought we could hold on to our old ideas. So he goes back down to the bar after a very short time because he wants to see if the seat still fits his fanny. So he goes back. And as he sits there, you know, he's going to show everybody and impress everybody. Oh, look, I can come and do the same thing all over again, and I can stay sober. Yeah. And uh, he opens his wallet, and the thorns happen to see what's in it. And the big old thistle behind the bar says, you know, you've been good a long time. You ought to have one. He says, I think I will. So he does. Doesn't last very long. Then again, the sower goes out to sow seed. And this time it falls on very stony ground. And because it has no roots, and it's very shallow, it soon dies out. This is the person that says, I don't need the spiritual part of the program. Well, you don't need any of it. All the program is spiritual as far as that's concerned. 
And then again, the sower goes out to sow seed, and this time it falls on very fertile ground. And hence, up it comes. I like to feel this morning that you and I, our seed fell on fertile ground. I know mine was fertile, because when I came in here, I was steeped in manure, so I had to, it had to fall on very fertile ground, no doubt about it. I think it's always has been customary to, for one to tell when and where they were born. Well, I was born, that's obvious, I'm here. And when I was born is none of your business, so we won't go into that either, as far as that's concerned. I like to think of this miracle that came into my life, and it certainly, my friends, was a miracle. Because I tell you, as I told you in the beginning, I'm not going to go through a blow-by-blow -blow description of how drunk I got and what I... When I came in here, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this. I drank anything that was too thin to chew. Uh, by that time, I was drinking quite a bit of wine. Now, my friends, I am not a wino. I never was. Women are not winos. They're winettes. And... Uh, And the first drink I had was not wine. It was something else that my grandfather had conjured up in a bottle that had whiskey in it and uh, rock candy and a whole lot of other foolishness. And he would come in on very wet days and he would open the drawer and uh, get this bottle out and take two, three swigs out. He'd cripple in there. You know, he had arthritis, all these things that the old people have. And he would cripple in there and take out two, three slugs and sit down and rub his leg, and then he could walk out. And I saw this, this must be elixir from the gods to do a person like that. So I tried it. I switched in there one day, and I took two, three swigs out of that bottle, and I went out the way he came in, crippling. <laughs> but you see, I had now found a loving friend. You see, I was one of those people that was always full of self-pity. I was an orphan, you know? And you see, there wasn't no more orphans in the United States then but me, and uh, I felt terribly sorry for myself all the time. Now, with this wonderful elixir, who in the world needs parents, you know? It's bad enough to have to put up with grandparents, let alone parents, see? That was bad enough. So this sort of thing went on. This was the beginning of it. And it went on and on. I got married. I did all the things, I suppose, that a young woman does, and most of the things that some young women don't do. I suppose I did them all. And uh, I uh, made the unfortunate mistake of marrying a gambler, and he uh, was throwing it away faster than I could drink it up, so I had to get rid of him. <laughs> and I, I had two children. They turned out to be marvelous people, just lovely people, you know, and those kind of things. Uh, you know, had I been coming along in today's standards, I think I'd have just had the kids and got it over with. But uh, you did a little bit different in those days. My children, they loved me. They thought I was the most wonderful mother on the face of this earth when I was drinking. They didn't think so when I got sober. But as long as I was drinking, they thought I was wonderful. You know, I never hit anybody or beat anybody. Who in the world is going to hit anybody upside the head and hear them cry and you got a hangover? You don't do that. <laughs> you simply give them a quarter and send them to the show and say, next time I'm going to get you. <laughs> and if I woke up in the morning and the children wanted popsicles for breakfast, they got popsicles because you don't have to cook popsicles. So we, we got along all right. We did very well there. And uh, as I still say, they, they turned out beautiful. I had this dear old friend, bless her heart, who used to tell me what was wrong with my drinking. You know, she never told me I shouldn't drink. She was an old gal, and I was a young gal at the time. And uh, the old gal needed the young gal uh, because when you went into a bar or a tavern why no self-respecting gentleman would buy the uh, young gal a drink without buying the old gal a drink. Uh, that works. I played on both leagues. I know it works, you know. <laughs> and uh, I used to try my best to tell her how badly I would feel, but I didn't feel bad enough to quit. I used to tell her, well, you know, uh, uh, I, I can't understand why in the world that I throw up so much. She said, oh, we can mend that, you know. If you just take a little olive oil before you go out to drink tonight, you will not get drunk and you will not throw up. Well, instead of being a long, tall, puking drunk, I was a long, tall, greasy puking drunk. That was the only difference. And then she would tell me about these horrible hangovers that I would have. 
Now, dear, if you'll just get a bottle of beer and you open that and set it down beside of your bed and let it get flat and drink it first thing in the morning, you will not have a hangover. Well, I don't know whether you will or not. There's no way in the world that I could go to sleep with a full bottle of beer sitting down beside your bed. <laughs> that, that just wouldn't work. So these sort of things went on and on. Now, I'm going to tell you, I have to tell you of one, I have to tell you of this incident to let you know what this helpless, hopeless drunk here was like. When I say, when I had reached this stage, see, I, in the meantime, I, I got a job uh, as barmaid. I was a barmaid in, uh, for almost 20 years off and on, you yeah? See, I believed in on-the-job training. I, I, I like to drink so well, you know? And, uh, but finally, you know, first you work at nice places, and then, you know, you, you know, you're not nice, so no, first thing you know, you're working in nightclubs, and then you work in bars, and then you work in dens, and then you work in dives, it goes like that, and then you just simply get fired. That's what happens. Well, of course, when you fired me, it didn't make any difference, I'd go back next night anyway. But on this particular incident that I must tell you about, to let you know about my hopelessness, my helplessness. This little community in which I lived at this particular time, uh, we were very, very proud because we had the first four black nuns ever in the state of Michigan. And we had, I'm always saying we, they. You know, you ever notice that anybody that doesn't do anything and anything nice gets done, say, look what we did and you haven't done anything, you know. <laughs> you, you can do, you can watch that in AA. Oh, we had a wonderful time. We, and you haven't done a thing about it, you know. But anyway, uh, we had this lovely little three-room schoolhouse and all that sort of thing. So they were going to throw a big festival, you know, to show our gratitude to Almighty God and to uh, uh, the people of the, our parish and everything else. And So they're going to have this big to-do. Father, bless his heart, had invited all the dignitaries from over town to come out there. And I decided maybe I had better go up and help them celebrate this particular morning. But when I woke up, I, have you ever felt the call of the wild goose? You, you know, the, it, it's a weird call, you, you, you know. And I said, well, now, I'm not going to drink. I know anything about AS, but I'm not going to drink this morning. But I could still hear the call of the wild goose, you know. So I go up there and I said to Mother Superior, Mother, is there anything you want me to do? And she says, darling, go and enjoy yourself. I'll send for you when I need you. Never tell a practicing alcoholic to go and enjoy himself. It's terrible. <laughs> so I went back to the caretaker's house, and there at the caretaker's house, they had this cooking wine. It's no good, you know. And they were serving little glasses, little insult glasses, about like that, <laughs> to the older people that came in. And, uh, you know, everybody and somebody picked up another glass. His father just drank out of this glass. He went in my little insult glass. Oh, I got me a gratitude glass down, and uh, I had a nice drink. <laughs> well, then I, I began to feel this stuff, you know, and I even went and got some of my favorite brand, you know, when they, my favorite brand at that time was, you know, I always felt it was nice for women to drink wine. It, it was more sophisticated. Well, you ever seen anybody get look sophisticated drinking Mad Dog? <laughs> my favorite beverage. So anyway, by this time I felt maybe I ought to go out here and help Mother Superior and see if she wants me to do something. So I go over here and on my way over there I felt, well, maybe you ought to eat something before you go because if you are drinking, this will kill it. Now, you know, this is stupid. So one of our parishioners was making barbecue and he had a big pit there and all this kind of stuff and he wasn't waiting on me as fast as I thought that he should. You know how important we can get when we get drunk. So I took the piece of barbecue and I dipped it down in the sauce about up to there. And one of our good parishioners had the unmitigated nerve to say to me, Holly Martin, you can't do that. That woman shouldn't have said that to me. Now, I am told, in which I believe I probably did, and I know that I did, they said that I took the rib and hit the lady down across the head. I don't know. <laughs> now, I tried to justify that. I said, you know, after I got home, oh, I felt terrible. I, I felt awful. When I got through waving that rib around over that ground, there was nobody left but me and two balloons, you know? <laughs> and uh, everybody took flight, you know? The nuns with their bibs looked like they had been killing roaches or something with red spots. <laughs> Terrible. But I, on the way home, I tried to justify that. I said, now, why is she so angry at me for this? 
Samson took the jawbone of an ass and wiped out a whole army, and she don't even want to get hit with a rib of a pig. This is terrible. <laughs> you know, how could she feel like this? Well, the next day, the good father sent for me to come down there, and uh, here come two nuns, and they drug me up there. Everybody's out in the street. What's Martin done now, you know? When I got there, uh, I'm getting ahead of my story. You know, when I thought about what I had done, I looked at this beautiful picture of our divine Lord on the wall in my house. And I said, dear God, if ever again I take a drink of alcohol, strike me dead. You know, I meant that from the bottom of my heart. You know, there's other people who play beside God. If you don't know it, I'll tell you that. Nevertheless, when these two nuns came down and drug me up the street in front of everybody, everybody coming out of the pool room, the grocery store, oh, God, Martin did it again. So Father was was fresh out of pledges that day, and uh, he said, now, uh, Holly, let's you and I have a gentleman's agreement. Will you promise me you will never take a drink again until you see me take a woman into my house? Well, I readily agreed. Uh, you know, you'll agree to anything to get somebody off your back, so... But I got to thinking on the way home, now, I can't hang around here and watch this man and see what he's gonna do. <laughs> Maybe I should get a six-pack and think it over. So when I got home, I looked at this beautiful picture, and I said, Dear God, I didn't mean beer, you know? So I drank the beer. <laughs> and, uh... So then... The next thing I know, I'm drinking whiskey, and I said, God, I didn't mean whiskey. The next thing you know, I'm back drinking wine again, and I simply said, God, just forget it. That is helpless and hopeless. I said, God, just forget it. I am helpless, hopeless. But, you know, something had happened to me on a Saturday night. I happened to be home and alone. The radio was on. And I did not turn the radio on to this particular station because when you are in my predicament at that time, you hear voices all the time so you don't have to turn the radios on. <laughs> but a story came on over this radio. It was called The Glass Crutch. And it was about a woman that had a drinking problem. To this day, I do not remember any of the ingredients of this story. But all I know, it was about a woman that had a drinking problem. And said, if you ever need our help, we'll be the first number in the book. Well, I thought it was nothing that... Chick, if she'd just quit drinking whiskey and get some calm, cool, clean wine, she'd be all right. Now, you know, no 12-step call is ever made is ever wasted. I don't care how you say, well, I wasted my time. No, you didn't. I don't know who, other than but for the grace of God, that that message came to me that night. And don't ever be upset because the person doesn't respond immediately. Because it was several years later before I responded to what I had heard. Finally, that day did come. When I did look in that book, and there it was, the first number in the book, like they said it would be. All I could remember was the glass crutch, but over the years, those words haunted me. When I walked down the street, it seemed as if the heel plates on my shoes would beat out the words, the glass crutch. The clock no longer said tick-tock, it said the glass crutch. This didn't happen every day or every month, but certain times it would happen. Finally, that day came when I looked in the book, and as I told you before, it was there. I called the number. You know, have you ever did something, and, you know, you say, now, wait a minute, wasn't I in bad enough trouble without calling anybody? And why did I do this for? The lady said to me, uh, she finally got my name out of her, got my name out of me, and she said, uh, I hear you're having a problem. Uh, are you telling me you're having a problem with your drinking? I said, oh, no, I, I got a friend out here. I said, I think she's losing her mind. Would you send somebody to come talk to her? And the lady said, well, would you like to have somebody come talk to you? I said, oh, I hung up, and first thing you know, I'm right back on that phone again. And this time she, now, we sponsored in those days. We, you know, people nowadays, they don't, well, I guess some of them do. You can't talk about everybody like that. But I mean, when you you got held hostage, if you when your sponsor got hold of you, you know, she said, "I will have someone call you," and she did. This lady called me, and uh, she said, uh, "I hear you're having a trouble with your drinking." Same thing. Well, no, I, I didn't understand this kind of lingo. Having trouble with my drinking, I might have trouble getting it, but not drinking it. I couldn't understand what she's talking about. She said, "Well, I will be out to see you." Okay. And when they said they're coming to see you, they came. They didn't pass you on to somebody else. They went. Okay. Ish came. But do you know, alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. 
about 45 minutes before that lady could get there. Now, I had now reached the stage of zombieism. That is, if you drink, you don't get drunk, and if you don't drink, you don't get sober. You know, somebody holds your hand up and stay that way. About 45 minutes before time for this lady to come and take me to a meeting, two lush-head friends of mine came by, and they gave me a couple of drinks and the same as pouring coal oil into dying embers. You know, you always get drunk when you shouldn't. Okay. That woman gave me that morning, that evening, when she got there, the most profound message that I can ever be able to give anybody. She said these words to me as I stood there looking out the window. I said, you know, I've got to do something on account of my kids. She said, do something for yourself and everything else will be all right. And you know, she's right. Do something for yourself and everything else will be all right. It was like the kid, this youngster who wanted very much to play with his father. And his father was a very, very busy man. And he'd been promising the child that he would play with him. And so he had a large map on the wall, and he took, took the map off of the wall, and he tore it into many pieces. And he said, son, when you get this map put back together, daddy will be through with his work. Then you and I can play. We can play ball together. It wasn't long before the child got the pieces of the map together, and he ran in, and he showed them to his father. And his father said to him, son, how did you get the map together so soon? He says, father, on the other side of the map was a picture of a man. And when I got the picture of the man together, the whole world fell in place. And that's exactly what happened. You know, it fell in place. You know? But this woman, honest to goodness, I, I was scared to death of this sponsor of mine. She had buck teeth. I didn't know whether she was going to bite me or smile, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, She always kept whipping out this who me on me, you know. If the slightest provocation, she'd whip out this who me. Now, just answer yes to three, dear, and you're in. I thought, oh, Betty must be getting 50 cents a yes. <laughs> Is drinking clouding your reputation? Well, if you've been drunk for over 20 years, you don't know whether it's cloudy or not. No. Do you seek a lower environment while drinking? Why, no, I merely created a lower environment while drinking. Then she asked one of the dumbest questions you can ask anybody, especially a practicing alcoholic. Do you prefer to drink alone? If I'm buying it, yes. If you're buying it, no. That's where we're at talking about it. Okay. Now, you talk about discipleship. I became, now I'm not going to tell you, oh, from the first moment I walked into AA, everything's been lovely. No, 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 no. That's not true. Oh, from the first moment I came into AA, I fell madly in love with it. No, 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 no. But with the kind of sponsor I had, love or no love, you kept going. You know, anyhow. <laughs> you sat there surrounded by an aura of hate, you know. But it began to melt a little at a time, just chipping away a little at a time. And that woman was constantly talking about becoming a disciple, becoming a disciple. What? Huh? You learn to listen. You know? And then you listen so you can learn. And that is exactly what happened. You know, you didn't get sober five minutes late and somebody said, like, You're speaking tomorrow night. Just put sponsors say, No, she isn't. She hasn't got anything to talk about. You shut up. She was right, I didn't. But nevertheless, as time went on, and as I said, there was many times that I resented you, I resented the program, I resented everything. Same. But I did not, through the grace of God in this fellowship, take a drink. Why? I cannot tell you it is because that I fell madly in love with the program at first. No, that grew on me. But I will tell you one thing. I was chicken. Yeah? And I would rather be chicken than what comes out of the end of the chicken. Yeah? <laughs> so I did not take that drink, you know? And then finally, little by little, see, love doesn't burst on people like me right away. Because first and foremost, I didn't trust anybody. Nobody whatsoever, uh-uh. But then I learned what it meant to be a disciple. A disciple is a person, shall we say, as I told you before, learns how to listen. And then he listens so he can learn. But one thing above all, he must or she must learn, and that is discipline. If you have the kind of sponsor I had, you're going to learn it. I'm going to tell you that right now, you know. You either learn it or you just, you're just going to knock open the door next time she comes. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about this morning, my friends, about you and I, and the discipleship that has been laid or given, the mantle of discipleship that has been laid on your shoulders and mine. I often think of that first step 
where we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable. I call that step Peter because it brings me the message of humility. Now, if you can remember about Peter, he was one of those loud, impulsive, shall we say, people, light, very unmanageable, but a born leader. It's exactly what he was. But he was full of fear, and he was a coward. And he was very boisterous, bragging. He was the one, if you can remember, that when our divine Lord said to him, you will deny me, and Peter says, oh, no, 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 Lord, never. But see, the time of testing had not come. And this sort of thing can happen to you and I, unless we have found what we have found. How many times in our lives have we said, I'll never take another drink? Never in my own, no, 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 no. But the time of testing had not come, as it hadn't come to Peter. And finally, when that time of testing came, and Peter, shall we say, denied our divine Lord, it says that he wept bitterly. But first, before he wept bitterly, when his hand was called for his denial, what did he do? He went to cursing and swearing. Can you identify right there? How many times have I said, like Peter, never again will I take a drink, and somebody says, hey, Holly, you're drinking. Yeah. What's it to you? It ain't none of your business. You didn't buy it. I'm not drinking anyhow. Mm-hmm. And then finally that time came after swearing that I'd never do it again. That's the reason why this program is so wonderful one day at a time. You know, just one day. But finally that time of testing after making all of those promises came. You know. And I, like Peter, I wept bitterly. It broke my heart. Because the very thing that I did not want to do, I did just like that. And many times when we say, I will never ever take Another drink. We go right back where it is. You remember about Peter, the last, his last denial when he stood there, warming his hands by the fire with a centurion. You see, every time I walked into one of those bars and said I wasn't going to drink, I was only warming my hands by the fire with a centurion, standing right there at the bar, saying, oh, no, I'm not going to drink, you know. So finally the centurion who was the bartender says, have you have a drink? Come on, you can have one, you know, pay me some other time. Mm-hmm. The time of testing. That is why this fellowship means so much to me, my friends. Each and every one of you know about the time of testing. That's why they tell us in the beginning just one day at a time. Because we're going to meet that time of testing. And can I stand the test? I don't know. I didn't know then, but I know now. How do I withstand that time of test now? Well, I'll tell you. I don't warm my hands for the fire with the centurion, you know. He can have the whole blaze as far as I'm concerned, you know. Oh, no, I don't go in a high tower and shut myself up. The big book there tells me if there's places that I need to be where there is alcohol to go. Do what I've got to do and come away from there. I don't have to stand there and say, well, you know, I sure am watching you all have a good time. El Toro Poo Poo. You're not standing there watching them have a good time. You're standing there feeling sorry for yourself. Me, so I go home. This, my friend, is the beginning of humility. Because when that time of testing comes, you and I forget that we're powerless over alcohol and our lives are unmanageable. See, just that one won't hurt. Then I can remember the anguish that I have gone through. And so this, to me, was a great lesson. And then another disciple comes into my mind, Thomas. Thomas the Doubter. The second step tells me we came to believe in a power greater than ourselves that could restore us to sanity. Thomas had to have the same thing, or I had to have the same thing that Thomas had. Belief by experience. You know, sometimes we will say, well, you know, I just don't believe in this God stuff. And we'll keep saying it over and over. Because this can be quite an attention getter. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't believe in this. I don't believe in that attention getter. Well, if you don't believe, shut up. You know, don't keep coming back every night telling me that. You know? so just sit around, keep quiet, and then maybe you will come to believe. That's what the step says, came to believe. Here was Thomas, our dear boy. He says, I just can't believe it. I just cannot believe that our divine Lord, uh, that he rose from the dead. I just cannot believe this thing. 
He says, I can only believe it if I can put my fingers in the wounds. If I can only touch the wounds in his side and in his fingerprints, then I can believe. You see, belief by experience, that's what many of us have to have. And sure enough, our divine Lord said to Thomas, Thomas, stretch hither your hand. And when Thomas did, and he stretched forth his hand, and he ended the wound, he said, my Lord and my God. So many times you and I are afraid to stretch hither. We are a- afraid to death because we are afraid if I stretch my hand hither, it will call for a change, and I don't want to change. See, one cannot come to believe without changing. And you and I many times are afraid of this word or the action of change. But it is the thing that I found that I had to do, was to stretch forth my hand. If you wanted a taxi cab, what happened? You're just going to stand there like an idiot and let the cab run? You stretch hither your hand, and when you stretch your hand forth, the cab driver just don't take your hand down the street. He takes your whole body down the street, doesn't he? <laughs> And this is what happened to Thomas when he stretched hither his hand. Yeah, it's made all the way around. If you want one of those elevators, what are you going to do? Stand there and look at the thing, go up and down? You're going to push the button. You see, there was a woman, we are told also in the book of books, that had had a problem for a number of years. And it tells me that she went everywhere seeking help. Just everywhere that she could go. She'd gone to all the doctors, soothsayers, and whatever else they had in those days, all to no avail. And one day she sees a crowd of people, and in this crowd was our divine Lord, and she said, if I can just but touch the hem of his garment, just touch it. And that's all it's ask of you and I. Make yourself available. And then you don't have to worry the dickens out of it, but well, I can't see why it's happening like this. Came to believe, you know. Sometimes we're told in the second step, well, there's no action. Oh, yes, there is action, too. It's the blind man. And our divine Lord said, he made this spittle out of dirt and put it on his eyes. And he says, go and wash in the pool. Go and wash. And the blind man went. You see, it takes some action. You've got to get up instead of just sitting there. Oh, I don't believe this. I don't believe it. Okay. Go and listen to what someone else has to say. Listen. Keep an open mind. And when the blind man, when they had said to him, How are you able to see? What happened to you? He says, All I know, I was blind and now I see. That's all. I was blind and now I see. Someone says, How did you become sober? What do you do? Well, you know, I had Dr. So-and-so and I had psychiatrist so-and-so who had just jumped out the window two days before then and such and such a thing. All we've got to say was, I went to AA, I was blind, and now I see. Sometimes, my friend, it doesn't happen overnight. But you just keep going, it will happen. And then, my friends, we have our third step, where we're given the privilege of decision. And I like to call this step Matthew, because he brings me the message of decision, Matthew. See, Matthew was a tax uh, tax collector. At that time, his name wasn't even Matthew. It was Levi. And he did not like collecting taxes. He didn't like anything about his life. And the only people that he could associate with were people like himself. Can't you identify with him? The only people you and I at times had to associate was with people like ourselves. Nobody else is going to put up with you. You know that. Yeah. So Matthew was a very unhappy man. You know? He hated what he was doing. Have you ever drank and you hated it? And you drank because you couldn't stop and you hated it. Identify with this man that's sitting by the side of the road collecting taxes for the Roman Empire and he's hating every doggone bit of it. And one day our divine Lord come along and he said, Paul Matthew, come on Matthew, let's go. And it tells me that Matthew straightway left this booth and went. He didn't say, now Lord, you go on down the street, I'll catch up with you later. Or, uh, you know, I'm not quite ready yet. But Matthew had the privilege of decision. He could have hung around, said, I'm not going right now. But he had the privilege of 
the same privilege that's offered to you and I today. Do I want to make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him? You know? See, he had a choice. And once having a choice, he had a chance. And hence the decision was made. Now here is a choice that is presented to you and I every day because I could not stand here this morning before you love it lovely people and say, oh, when I first came in the program, I took the whole, the third step in its entirety, and I have never, it's always been the third step, oh no, I've had a terrible time with that third step. Many mornings I get up and I say, God, here I am, and sometimes I hear a voice and say, what, what for, you know, <laughs> Lord, here I am, use me. Five seconds later, Holly Martin has made up her mind what she's going to do, you know? Decision. This, to me, my friends, is the privilege that alcohol never gave you in your life. It was the privilege of decision. Did you ever bargain with alcohol? We try to bargain with God, don't we? But we try bargaining with alcohol. Yeah. Oh, I've tried that. I'm just going to drink an itty bit. And here I am, the bed's going around this way, and I'm laying there, and I said, well, I'll catch it next time it comes around. You know? <laughs> Bargaining, you know, bargain. Always, my friends, I had an ace up my sleeve, always. If God don't do such and such a thing, I know what I'm going to do. Ace up my sleeve. I always had an ace in the hole. Most of the time, me and the ace both fell in the hole. It just didn't work. It just did not work. Because it is a known fact, a man or a woman that does not take a stand for something will fall for anything. So then I had, my friends, the privilege of decision. Now, we come to our lovely fourth step, and that is a wonder. It's a wonder. Mm -hmm. Inventory. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Oh, my goodness. I call this step Philip. Because Philip was the common sense disciple. If he didn't know a thing, he asked. Many times he had to go to Andrew and the other disciples and ask questions. And hence, this is what I call common sense when it comes down to taking an inventory. If I don't know how or what to go about, I'm going to ask. Not just say, well, I'm sober and that's enough. You see, you cannot throw a silk blanket over a mule and make a racehorse out of him. It don't work like that, you know got to be more done to it than that, see. You see, Philip lived in this little town of Bethesda, and he hated it. It was a rowdy little town, and Philip could not change this town. Philip knew that he had to change Philip, and that is exactly what he did. Finally, when Philip met our divine Lord, he had a friend by the name of Nathaniel. And he said to Nathaniel, I think I have found him. And Nathaniel, well, I don't know whether you have or not. He said, come see. That is what you and I do in inventory when we feel, look, I've looked everywhere. But I haven't taken an inventory. There's nothing to salvage. Take it anyhow. And take the word of Philip. Come see. Come and see what's there. There may be something there that you can hold on to. I hate these kind of inventories where, oh, I'm a nasty, low-down, dirty skunk. I'm no good. You are some good. You just found out that you was a skunk. You know? <laughs> that took some doing to do that. You know? But let's be like Philip. Common sense. Take it. Come see what's there. Now, this fifth step, my friends, it's not the easiest one in the world. It's a tough city, but you need the milk. You know? Very tough. <laughs> Admit it to God, ourselves, and another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. I call this step, this step Judas. No. Because he brings me the message of self-forgiveness. When one takes the fifth step, where we admit to God, ourselves, and another human being. Don't you love those words? Another human being. It does, It could very easily say to us, admit to God ourselves and another person, but that's so cold, is it not? Human being. Someone that is understanding. Someone that has compassion. Someone that when you say, look, I want to talk to you, and you start to tell me, 
Oh, Lord, child, don't tell me you did that. Woo! I don't hear that. You know. <laughs> That's what people do. But we're talking about a human being. You see, my friends, so great was Judas's guilt because he had betrayed our divine Lord. So great was his guilt that he went and hung himself by the rope of self-condemnation. And many times today, you and I do the very same thing because we cannot forgive ourselves. We go and we condemn ourselves and hang ourselves by the rope of self-condemnation. You get down on your knees and you pray and you ask God to forgive you. Almighty God, and then you get, well, I can't forgive myself. Oh, you're greater than God, then, huh? Oh, that's cool, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And many times we hang ourselves by the rope of self-condemnation. We keep on condemning, condemning yourself. This isn't what God wants. You know, he wants you to be happy. He forgave you. Forgive yourself. Admit the hardest thing you're going to find about the fifth step. Admit to God that's not too bad. Another human being, that ain't too bad because you're going to lie to him most of the time anyway. No, until he catches up with you. But when one admits to yourself, have you ever looked in that mirror to admit something to yourself and you wish that you could have combed your hair and all of a sudden you'd become bald-headed so you wouldn't have to comb it because you don't want to look in that mirror? have to admit it to yourself. Yeah. When you go to put your teeth in in the morning, you know, sometimes, you know, you get them in sideways because you don't want to look in the mirror. Mm, that's not it. The fifth step. This is a step of freedom. It's a, it's a step of self-forgiveness. And now we have a friend here, Simon the Zealot. That's a sixth step. Entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. The reason why I call this step Simon the Zealot, because this man in, in our today's world would be called, shall we say, guerrilla warfare fighter. You know, he was, uh, he, he was really a fighter, guerrilla warfare. He would fight any way. It didn't have to be, shall we say, an honest fight. I wonder if there are any honest fights. I don't know. But he was Simon the Zealot. First and foremost, he had to get rid of the pain within himself before he could help others to rid themselves of their pain. Entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. He knew very good and well that he could not remove them himself. If you ever looked at that step entirely ready to have God remove them, it didn't say anything about Holly there. They left me out. They didn't say anything about you, George, or Jane, entirely ready to have God to remove them. Why? Because you cannot do it. If you ever said to me, oh, I wish I could stop lying. I wish I could stop lusting. I wish I could stop rusting. You know. <laughs> Entirely ready to have Almighty God do it. But that doesn't mean I don't have to put forth a little effort. If you've given a pile to the blue shield or whatever they call it out here, I don't know. To this pine, I'm going to get rid of it. So put it out on the porch and let the red shield or blue shield, whoever it is, fix up the tray. Leave it there. But do you go out and play on the pile until they come? Say, well, I'm going to sit here and play on it until they get here. No. You discarded it. Please leave it alone. See, I'm the one that just loves to go back and play on the pine, you know. One of those kind of things. In other words, one must have, why is the sixth step of so much importance? Entirely ready to have God remove all these defects. That little bitty word, all, isn't that a horrible word? All of them. You want to keep one or two, don't you? No, no. Because why? It removes the pain, my friend. We want the pain removed. Are you happy with that pain? Pain has never made anybody happy, as I've seen in all my life. Are you happy with pride? Are you happy with fear? Are you happy with resentment? You're not happy with those things. So until I have in, entirely ready to have God remove it, if you went to a doctor and the doctor said to you, you're hurting, oh God, it hurts. The doctor says, well, look, you got to have your appendix out. Well, just let it hurt, man. Don't take my appendix out. All I wanted to know what was wrong with me, but don't you dare touch me. Get away from me. They're going to burst. I got news for you. Self-pity. Oh, brother, I know all about that. See, jealousy causes pain. 
self-pity is malignant. Anxiety is contagious. And I want these things removed. I cannot do it. But oh boy, don't we just love to hold on to things that hurt. Because why? What was the step before that? Self-forgiveness. We don't want to forgive ourselves because in, in the event that I forgive myself, I might have to forgive you. And I don't want to forgive you, you know. Mm -mm. You know, I'd just rather just sit here and hurt. Let it hurt. And I can go to meetings and talk about the same thing every night, you know. How bad it hurts. And somebody said, why don't you cut it out? Oh, look what that'll do to my image. <laughs> and it's already screwed up. So now we have a little insignificant man. This little man was very small and very insignificant. His name was Nathaniel. And he was small and very insignificant. You would never tell him in a crowd, but oh my gracious, was he intelligent. Yeah. Humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. You say, well, them's a little bitty thing. Why I got to worry about a little bitty shortcoming? It's a tiny. Well, remember, the fleas come with the dog, you know? No. Now, let's look at the dog as being my character defect and the fleas. You know what I mean? There are some of my character defects through prayer and meditation that Almighty God can help me to use the right way. You know, my imagination, instead of lying on people, create an imagination of something wonderful that's going on, but i got to get rid of the fleas. That's exactly what I must do. You see, these little bitty things like pretense. You see, Peter, remember about Peter? He pretended. That he wasn't afraid. He pretended. And he wound up cursing and swearing and finally wound up crying because he pretended. Reservation, it can't happen to me. Little bit of things, oh, but it can, you know. Procrastination, I'm sorry. But I just can't do these things right now. I just keep putting them off and putting them off. Uh-huh. Remember, the fleas come with the dogs there. That's exactly what happened. Now we have steps eight and nine due to the shortness of time. We'll take them together. They belong together. Because it deals with amends. That we became willing to make amends. And we made direct amends. James and John, the sons of thunder. James and John known for love. And this is very hard for people like me. Very hard. See, love was one of those things, my friends, that did not come by to me very easily. I cannot say today, oh, I just fall in love with everybody all the time. Oh, no, uh-uh. See, the Bible tells me, lay not thy hand suddenly on no man. I can come to love you. And I try very hard because that is my job. In other words, direct to men. That one, my friends, sometimes we want to make excuses. Well, I did thus and so forth. And I think that I should be overlooked and not have to make amends because I am an alcoholic. Oh, my goodness gracious, you know. Mm -hmm. What do you want, condescension or respect? Well, I owe some bills, but, you know, I can go and tell them I'm an alcoholic. You know, I don't need to make any amends. I did this or that, but I'm going to tell them, you know, first I want you to know I'm an alcoholic. So what, you're an alcoholic? There's worse things than being an alcoholic. A whole lot worse. Being dead is worse than being an alcoholic, you know. But so, any, in other words, I want condescension. I don't want to make amends, you know. I do. Because why? I want your respect. I don't want you to condescend me. God doesn't want me to be like that. So I must become willing. See, sometimes we're afraid of making amends because you know why? People will find out you're human. And if they find out you're a human being, this is terrible. I don't want anybody to know I'm human. See? In other words, I'm Superman or woman. And people find out that you're human. You are afraid to be human because you're afraid of that button they may push. And that they may love you and you'll have to love in return. You'll find yourself growing to love in return. And you don't want this because there's your image again. Oh, this image is a mess, isn't it? Continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admit it. I call this step Jude Thaddeus. Because he brings me the message of steadfast. Remember his name was first Judas. But do you know, it was changed to Jude Thaddeus. Steadfast is 
That's the message. Because we remember what the other Judas did. So that is why he called Judas Thaddeus. So we won't get him mixed up with the other one. Sure, with a name like his, he could have quit the look. If I got to carry around a moniker like this, I quit. Because everybody's going to think about the Judas that betrayed him. But he was steadfast. That's what you and I have got to be is steadfast. When people start talking about, well, you know, I knew an alcoholic that did sit and sit the thing. And honey, I'm telling you too, he went to that thing you all go to and he still acts the same way. As him. Yeah. I must remain steadfast. You see, there are lots of times a lot of people want to get you off track. Not everybody's delighted with your sobriety. Not everybody is. I would like to think that everybody is. But everybody isn't. Yeah. I've had people tell me you do the same thing you worse now since you got sober. I said, well, that's fine. I'm steadfast anyway. <laughs> you see, they always put the worst accidents in the paper. You never pick up the paper and say, James Smith went home tonight or got up this morning and he had bacon and eggs for breakfast and he kissed his wife and kids and went to work. You don't hear that, do you? But if James Smith got up this morning and knocked the hell out of his wife and kicked the dog and put the kids out, it's in the paper, isn't it? So you're always going to hear the worst of everything. But we will, you and I will remain steadfast. So-and-so's coming to the program. He's going to mess up the program. He may mess up his program. He ain't going to mess up mine. You know, because I'm going to remain steadfast. Now we have a beautiful step, the 11th step, where we start through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. Praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And I call that step Luke. Remember, Luke was a physician, and this is the healing step, the eleventh step here, sought through prayer and meditation. You see, Luke did not walk with the other disciples with our divine Lord. Luke came along later, and he had to be very thorough. He had to investigate all of the events before he could write this beautiful book that he wrote, you know, prayer and meditation. And here's our boy, Luke, that his thoroughness. He was very, very thorough. If you ever read, shall we say, Luke's message, you will find very thoroughness there. And this is what where you and I find thoroughness. This is where you and I find healing in that 11th step. In other words, let us look, if we can, for a few minutes, a conscious contact. What is a conscious contact? It's coming to know and to love a conscious contact. If you've ever gone to pick out a card for somebody's birthday, you just don't go in and grab the first card and find, oh, send it to him. I don't like him anyway. You try to find a card that will say something in it or remind you of him or telling this person how you feel about him. Because why? You're trying to establish a conscious contact with this person. And hence it is in the 11th step, this, shall we say, healing step. You see, you and I I don't know about you, but me. I am constantly in the recovery room. As long as I live, I will be in the recovery room. Because I have had, shall we say, one of the greatest of all operations. I've had a personality operation. No human being can give you a personality operation. It can only be given by the master surgeon. And I do not need a nurse or a doctor standing there watching my four vital signs. Pride, fear, resentment, and self-pity. You know, when you're in the hospital and you got a nurse there, she's taking these full Bible signs all the time. Here I'm given the privilege of taking my own full Bible signs. And I can immediately get in touch with the greatest of all surgeons, And it is no problem whatsoever. Now we come down to the 12th step. Mm-hmm. Spiritual awakening. Having had a spiritual. See, I'm still old-fashioned. I still use the word experience. Because I like that word. That's the word I was taught first. And I, well, in, in, anyway, you, you've got to wake up before you can experience anything anyway, so it doesn't matter. Because it brings me a message of determination. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. Somebody wonder, ain't nothing happening to me. You ain't took no steps. That's why ain't nothing happening. Having had a spiritual awakening or experience as a result of these steps. I call this determination. There's Andrew. Andrew was one of those little people like we see that we've seen around here all weekend. Very, very busy doing something. But not standing up beating on their chest and look at me, I'm great. Determination. He was quiet and always very busy. 
But there's one thing. He made the first 12-step call. Andrew brought the greatest of all the apostles, Peter. But you know what made Andrew great? He brought himself first. You can't bring nothing to nobody unless you've got something to take. You know? You know what the big book says? Make sure your own house is in order. So that, my friend, is exactly where it is. You know? In other words, you and I are not going to be able shall we say, pull everybody out of the murk and mire, but we will leave the seed there. Let me bear with you, bear with me one moment, please. There was once an eagle. This eagle thought he was so great. Yeah. He says, I, oh, he felt so good about his wings. He stretched them, and oh, my gracious. He saw a seal one day that had just come up on the side there, and he was laying there in all this slime and slick. But this seal was happy there. He didn't want to move. This eagle says, I gotta get him out of there, and the seal says, and the seal says, I don't want to go. So the eagle, because of all of his strength and his glory, so he feels, he goes down, and he tries to pull the seal out. And in his frustration, trying to be so great, as he sticks his talons into the seal, the flesh around his talons, the seal's flesh around the eagle's talons, pulls in upon him. And the more frustrated the eagle became, the closer the flesh of the seal came around his talons, and one was pulling one way and another was pulling the other way. And finally that seal just drug that eagle right on out there in the river and drowned it. See, this can happen to me. What does the big book tell you? When you're not doing too good with that person, don't screw up the chance. Go on to somebody else, you know, because their talents may get in there, and I've tried to practice this in all my affairs. Not only just this one, but all of them. When I find that I, my, I'm sticking my claws in too deep because it is my will, I want you out of there. I want you to see how great I am. And honey, you can get drugged right on out there and get drowned. You see, I'm telling you, my friend, one of the disciples said to our divine Lord one day, how far shall I go with my fellow man? And our divine Lord said to the edge of the pit. He just said, I'm about falling off down in there with you. You know, the edge of the pit. You know. But it's very important that you and I carry the message because, my friends, it is of utmost importance. See, our divine Lord said to his disciples, when you are converted, strengthen your brother. Now, I'm not trying to talk religion to you. I'm just telling you. You know what conversion is? It means change. You've ever had an old gas stove, you know, or a coal stove that you convert it to gas or something else. So when you are changed, strengthen your heart. That is carrying the message. Not only do we strengthen the new person, we must strengthen one another. You say, well, I don't have all the requirements to do this. Let me ask you this. What requirement does one have to have? Do you have to have an MS or whatever else you have to go out and tell a person that there is a solution? You don't have to have that. Do you have to have a degree to go out and tell a person, I love you, I'm trying to love you, let me love you? You don't need a degree for that. I'm not against degrees. Not in no way, shape, or form. But I must use that which has been given to me. And this is what, my friends, has been given to me. You see, all this weekend around here, we see what price disciples are. And what price is disciples? People are wearing badges, which tells you that they're on the committee. And people are telling you that uh, what part that they are playing. That is their badge to show that they are a part of it. What badge have you and I? It's in your face. It's in that handshake that you give people. You know, sometimes you shake the hands with people feel like you just picked up a wet rag, you know. <laughs> it was in all of those things. What is the price of this discipleship? Our divine Lord told you. A new commandment that I give you. That you love one another. And by this shall all men know you are my disciple. God bless you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.